These pieces of footage do not look like a lake going through a normal drought. They look like a reservoir being drawn down too fast to adjust. At Lake Powell, water levels have fallen to thresholds once considered extreme scenarios. And what is unsettling is how much faster this is happening than any safe forecast ever assumed. White mineral lines have appeared on canyon walls so quickly that engineers have had to rewrite operating plans. Marinas are left hanging in open air. Infrastructure built for a stable water level now sits in the wrong place. And if you think this is only a problem for one desert lake, pause here. Lake Powell is a foundation for power, water, and the livelihoods of tens of millions of Americans. When that foundation weakens, the impact does not stop at the scenery. What many people do not expect is that while the lake is dropping at an alarming pace, decisions and plans are still moving forward, as if time were on our side. That tension is what this footage quietly begins to reveal. Let us take a closer look. One, the reservoir designed to fail is now failing. In some parts of the United States, all it takes is a glance at the water to know something has slipped out of its familiar rhythm. At Lake Powell, time is no longer measured in calendar dates. It is measured by bright rock lines climbing canyon walls, by marina stairways hanging in the air, and by boat ramps that once lay deep underwater now stretching farther each summer. Aerial footage does not feel like a lake temporarily drawing down. It feels like a massive body slowly losing water. What was once seen as a secure reserve for the dry west has narrowed into winding channels cutting through bare sandstone. The feeling is not of nature resting between dry seasons, but of something deeper taking place. There was a time when this place stood as an engineering achievement, a reservoir built to hold wet years in reserve for dry ones. A system large enough to convince people that drought could be managed with enough planning, enough concrete, and enough time. That belief held for decades. The images today no longer match that confidence. Water is not just falling season by season, but year after year. Each year drops below a level once considered unnecessary to plan for. At some marinas, visitors walk hundreds of yards across dried mud just to reach the water. Elsewhere, docks are abandoned entirely, as if the lake has retreated from the very infrastructure built to serve it. This change does more than reshape the landscape. It touches daily life. Tourism contracts. Seasonal jobs disappear. Plans once built around steady water are rewritten shorter, more cautious, filled with fine print. What was once considered reliable now comes with conditions. The concern is that Lake Powell does not stand alone. It supports a chain of decisions downstream. As water levels fall, technical questions no longer sound hypothetical. They arrive as warnings. How much water is enough for the system to keep running? how much marks the line beyond which everything must change. And while those questions are still being weighed, the water does not pause for answers. Here lies the paradox. What was built to shield society from natural uncertainty is now creating a new kind of uncertainty. No announcement is needed. It shows up in low water warning signs, in choices made season by season instead of decade by decade. Lake Powell did not shrink because of one single moment. It shrank through many small decisions made over many years all resting on the same assumption that the river would return as it always had. That assumption once held true. The images now passing across the screen no longer confirm it. What remains is a deeper unease, a sense that this system is operating close to its limits. And when a system reaches its limits, every next decision stops being purely technical and becomes a matter of priorities. If there is not enough water for everything, the question is no longer how far the level has fallen. It becomes what will be preserved, and what will have to be let go when that limit is crossed. 2. Why Water Decisions? Here control lives far away. As the white rock lines on canyon walls grow longer with each season, there is one detail that unsettles many people more than the shrinking surface of the lake itself. Not because it is dramatic, but because it runs against common sense. When a reservoir is approaching its limits, the natural response of any system is usually to tighten up, to move more cautiously, to pause major plans until there is clearer certainty. Yet in this basin, an infrastructure proposal continues to surface more frequently, almost as if it were written for a future where water will return exactly as it once did. Its name sounds ordinary, even managerial, the Lake Powell Pipeline. 
a long pipeline designed to carry water from this very reservoir to a rapidly growing area in southwestern Utah. On paper, it reads like a familiar Western American story. Population increases, demand rises, and a project is proposed to secure water reliability for the future. But footage from Lake Powell changes the tone of that story. Each time the camera passes abandoned marinas, each time the water line retreats dozens of feet from former markers, viewers are left with a simple question. If the system is already under strain, who is still able to plan as if it is not? Supporters of the project speak about legal water rights, about the need to prepare for growth, about the danger of freezing a region's future because of a difficult period. It sounds reasonable. It sounds very American, rooted in a history where infrastructure was often built ahead of demand. Opponents, however, do not argue from emotion. They see the project as a test, a test of timing, of assumptions, and of precedent in a basin where every gallon of water has been promised many times over for decades. They ask this, if a new pipeline can move forward while water levels continue to fall, what does that mean for the rest of the river? It suggests that some places are still confident enough to bet on the future, while others have already been forced to live with cutbacks and uncertainty. What makes the issue especially sensitive is that Lake Powell is not a private reservoir belonging to any one place. It is a central buffer for the entire system. When more water is withdrawn here, it does not just affect the lake's surface level. It taps into the reserve the system relies on to survive future dry years. It touches the stability that distant communities depend on, even if they have never heard the project's name. That is why this proposal is not viewed as just another construction project. It is seen as a question of priorities. Who is allowed to turn scarcity into a long-term plan? Who must treat scarcity as a signal to stop? And who receives the consequences after the decisions have already been made? If you live near Lake Powell, you may feel this first through tourism, through marinas closing early, through shorter business seasons. If you live farther away, you may feel it through something rarely associated with a desert lake. Electricity prices, food costs, rising expenses whose causes are never clearly named. What matters is that this story is still being written. The project is not yet a final decision. It is a line being drawn on a map while the water beneath it continues to fall. That overlap is what creates unease. Because if Lake Powell is declining at a rate that forces the entire system to tread carefully, the question is no longer whether the project exists. The question is what assumptions it rests on. And if those assumptions prove wrong, who will be forced to adjust first, before everyone else even understands what has changed? 3. Old Water Promises Breaking Under a New Reality One reason the story around Lake Powell feels so difficult to grasp is not a lack of data, but the fact that many decisions today are still built on promises made in a very different era. A time when the river ran fuller, when snowmelt was more predictable, when dry years were seen as exceptions. On paper, the system appears orderly. Each party has a share. Each need is assigned a percentage. As long as water flows as it once did, everything works, but the past several years no longer match that picture. Inflows into the reservoir are often lower than older agreements assumed. Shortage, once rare, has become the operating condition. Reports no longer ask whether the system will fall short, but how much it will fall short and for how long. In that setting, rights once considered secure begin to look different. They do not disappear, but they can no longer all be honored at the same time. A commitment upstream can directly collide with expectations downstream. A decision made to stabilize the system in one place can create real instability in another. No party is legally wrong, yet no party is guaranteed what it once expected. This is where projects that rely entirely on historical rights begin to be seen differently. The Lake Powell pipeline is not the first proposal in the basin, but it arrives at the most sensitive moment. On a map, it is a straight line from the reservoir to a growing region. In practice, it means drawing additional water from a node that is supposed to serve as a buffer for the entire system. The critical issue is not the volume withdrawn each year, but how it affects the system. Lake Powell exists to absorb natural shocks, to store water for dry years, and to maintain consistent flows downstream. When levels are low, every gallon withdrawn does more than lower the surface slightly. It thins the safety margin the system relies on to endure future dry cycles. As that margin shrinks, Technical thresholds appear sooner. Releases must be managed more cautiously. Flexibility across the basin narrows. Opponents, therefore, do not center their argument on legality. 
they question timing and precedent. If a new withdrawal project can advance while federal reports repeatedly warn of shortages, what message does that send? That the system still accepts long-term plans built on the assumption that water will return to former levels. And if that assumption fails, who will be forced to adapt first? Here, the lake's decline is not a sudden collapse but a cumulative effect. Years of low inflows, weak snowmelt seasons. Layered on top of that, decisions that continue to rely on old rights make each subsequent dry season riskier than the last. Lake Powell is not shrinking only because of climate. It is shrinking because the system is still operating as if climate has not fundamentally changed. This creates a divide between the right to wait and the obligation to adapt. Some communities are positioned to believe that flows will be maintained at all costs. Others are forced to reduce first, cut first, and live with uncertainty longer. It is one system, but not everyone stands the same distance from risk. Seen from afar, Lake Powell reflects that imbalance clearly. Each exposed rock line is not just a marker of low water, but a sign that an old assumption is wearing away. And while negotiations continue, every new plan drawn on a map becomes a quiet statement. A signal that between the promises of the past and the realities of the present, some actors remain confident enough to bet that the river will still break in their favor. 4. The pipeline planned while the lake kept dropping. There is a moment in this story when everything comes into sharper focus. Not when the lake reaches another record low, but when people realize that shortage does not automatically bring all plans to a stop. Some plans, in fact, become more concrete. The Lake Powell pipeline enters the picture again, no longer as an abstract idea, but as a clear line drawn across a map. An intake point at Lake Powell connected to rapidly expanding communities in southwestern Utah, on paper, it is described in language familiar across the American West. Stability, future planning, orderly growth. But when that line is placed over the reality of the lake, the feeling changes. The place where this project would draw water is not a surplus source. It is the remaining buffer of the system, the space every state depends on when dry years stretch longer than expected. Pulling water from here is not like turning on a new tap. It is more like shaving away the margin of safety the entire basin is trying to preserve. Supporters often point out that the projected withdrawals are not enormous compared to the lake's total capacity. That argument sounds reasonable if Lake Powell is treated as a static tank. But the reservoir does not work that way. It fills seasonally, releases water to meet commitments, and constantly shifts to balance the broader system. When levels are already low, the effect of each additional gallon withdrawn is no longer linear. It pushes the system more quickly toward technical thresholds where options narrow and risks rise. What worries many experts is not a single season of withdrawals, but the long-term assumption behind the project. The pipeline is designed to operate for decades. It rests on the belief that future flows will be sufficient both to supply new urban growth and to preserve the reservoir's regulating role. Yet recent federal reports repeatedly warn that shortage is no longer an exception and that truly normal years are becoming rarer. At this point, the Lake Powell pipeline takes on a different meaning. It is no longer just a water supply project. It becomes a statement about how the future is being imagined, a signal that even as evidence suggests the system needs to contract, some places still feel confident expanding on the back of shared water. That is where quiet friction emerges. At the same time, other communities in the basin have already adjusted expectations. They cut irrigation. They close marinas earlier each year. They adapt to shorter business seasons. Meanwhile, elsewhere, new planning documents continue to be approved, and future population numbers are calculated as if water were a guaranteed variable. This contrast does not require raised voices. It is built into the system's logic. When one part chooses to keep growing, the rest is left carrying the responsibility of stability. And if that growth rests on a faulty assumption, the cost is not paid only at the intake point. It spreads across the basin. For that reason, the Lake Powell pipeline is no longer just Utah's concern or the story of a single pipe. It becomes a test for the entire system, a test of whether the American West will adjust to the new reality of scarcity or continue clinging to growth models shaped when the river ran far fuller. 5. Who pays first when the system starts cutting back? The consequences of decisions around Lake Powell are no longer confined to maps or technical reports. They are beginning to show up in everyday life, slowly but persistently, 
enough to change how people plan from one season to the next. For communities near the lake, the first signal is work. Tourism does not collapse overnight, but it contracts in small steps. Peak seasons shorten. Some marinas close earlier because water conditions no longer allow access. Local businesses operate cautiously, hesitant to extend hours or hire full staffs as before. Seasonal workers still arrive, but with no certainty they will be scheduled for enough weeks or months. Downstream, water takes on a different form. Here it is tied to fields, irrigation calendars, and farming decisions. When the system tightens, agriculture often feels it first. Water schedules are adjusted seasonally. Acreage is reduced at sensitive times. These changes are not always labeled cuts, but they are enough to affect yields, input costs, and eventually food prices on store shelves. Then there is electricity. Lake Powell once stood as a symbol of stable, low-cost hydropower for the West. As levels fall, that stability grows more fragile. Managers plan for shortfalls. Contracts are written more cautiously. For many households far from the lake, the impact does not arrive as an environmental alert, but as small, recurring increases on monthly bills. What stands out is that the groups who feel these effects first are rarely part of the major discussions. They are not in the rooms where operating scenarios are debated. They do not directly decide whether a new project should move forward. They experience the outcome only after decisions are set and the water has slipped past another marker. That mismatch creates a quiet unease. Not an immediate outburst of anger, but a fatigue that builds over time. A sense that some communities are being asked to adapt very early, while others are still able to believe the system will hold for them a while longer. At that point, Lake Powell reflects more than falling water levels. It reflects who pays first when a system under strain begins to move from decisions on paper into the daily lives of ordinary people. 6. When the water runs out before agreements do. There is no dramatic finale to this story, no moment when the lake suddenly refills after one wet season. What is happening at Lake Powell ends in a quieter way, and that is what makes it more unsettling. The water-sharing agreements once treated as the backbone of the West are nearing points where they must be rewritten. On paper, they are clauses, terms, scenarios expressed in technical language. In reality, the lake does not wait for negotiations to conclude. Water levels keep dropping, regardless of meeting schedules or draft revisions. At this stage, no one is talking about restoring things to the way they were. The language has shifted. Instead of recovery, people speak of adaptation. Instead of long-term stability, they speak of avoiding the worst case. That shift signals that the system has quietly accepted that old assumptions can no longer support the future. Lake Powell thus becomes more than a shrinking reservoir. It is where the basin's tensions converge between growth and limits, between long-term plans and short-term realities, between communities that have time to adjust and those that must adapt immediately before they even fully understand what is unfolding. What makes the picture uncomfortable is not uncertainty itself, but how uneven it is. Some places can wait another season or another round of talks. Others cannot. They feel change first through jobs, through living costs, through the realization that what was once promised as stable is now fragile. And so the story closes on something very simple. When water is no longer as abundant as before, the system is forced to choose. Not through loud declarations, but through small adjustments repeated over time. Each one preserves a piece of stability and lets another piece go. Lake Powell does not tell us which choice is right. It shows us that choices are already being made, little by little, as the water slips below assumptions once thought unbreakable. In that silence, the remaining question becomes clear. It is not how much water is left, but who will have to live with the new reality first, before the rest of the system has time to adjust. Thanks a lot for sticking with us till the very end. If you found this video useful, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe so you won't miss any of our daily uploads. And now, go ahead and explore some of our top recommended videos popping up on your screen. Goodbye, and see you in the next one.